I would love for the learning leaders to come up with their AI strategy that they can present to their executives and get buy-in on it so that everybody's on the same page of what we're trying to do. I think there's a lot of assumptions out there right now about where AI is at and what's possible. And doing more research and understanding it and putting that together, I think would be helpful for any business, especially in the learning space. This is Go To Market Magic. The show where we talk to go to market leaders and visionaries about the aha moments they've experienced and the pivotal decisions they've made all in the name of growth. Heather, who's up today? I'm really excited to be talking to Juliana Stan Campiano. She is the CEO of a company called Oxygen Experience. She's also the former president of the executive board of the Sales Enablement Society and did amazing things in the top leadership position there over the years. She works with companies big and small, some of the largest companies in the world. Listen to her and her organization on how do you take uh, really strategic initiatives from the boardroom to the keyboard to the sales force, to the people that are delivering them. And she manages those processes. So she has a front row seat to what is going on within learning, um, within enablement, and within AI and how it's being executed in these companies and her own company. Oh, this is going to be good. Juliana, welcome to Go to Market Magic. Thank you so much for having me, Heather. So you and I have been talking about this topic for a while, as has the rest of the world. So AI is huge right now. It's on everybody's lips. And I think that there's a lot of talk about, you know, content as far as marketing content and content that's written. Learning content is a little bit different. And the learning applications yeah. um, beyond just content are really uh, very exciting to me, but a little bit different than the conversation that's going on in kind of the general AI space. What do you think the most exciting possibilities are when we're thinking about how AI will play out in learning? Yeah, I, I think it's really interesting. And as you said, everybody started in the content space, really like marketing, you know, some of the other spaces. Learning is definitely different and we're embarking on it with clients. I think the exciting part for me is that um, content, you know, people are always have referred to this whole content as king for so many years and it's been debated on every which side. And now the content is out there and we have access to so much content. And I think that's the exciting part. And the drawback, I think, for the learning side is there is so much content. How do we know what good looks like? And that is, and I'd say that is really the crux of it from a learning perspective. So exciting because you have access to so much. And so no matter whether you have a small team, you know, I think We've all been around long enough where when businesses start learning is like maybe the last thing that starts, you know, once they've hit like some sort of level of maturity and amount of people, they're like, okay, we should probably be teaching our people something. And I think that can start a lot earlier uh, for companies and they can start uh, educating their workforce much earlier in the process of having a company and building a company versus what we've seen today because the access is going to be there. Um I feel like I'm full of caveats. It's like that being said, that being said. And um, I also think that there are going to be a lot of people that are able to do this that are maybe more subject matter experts in their area, but not very good at learning. And they're going to be able to use AI to create that learning that is going to actually help somebody versus what they might create themselves, which is typically way too dense, way too much way too. That's everything. really interesting because I think people are thinking about it from the opposite perspective of taking people who are in the learning profession, who are, you know, architects of learning and that may not have a lot of subject matter expertise can suddenly potentially pour all this stuff in there, get, source this stuff from um, potentially from AI that's pointed either at your internal or even external sources and say, mm -hmm. build me something. I know nothing about these topics or I know very little about these topics. Here's, we already have this structure in place. Here's all the inputs. Now go build something. So it's interesting that you see it from the opposite side of making subject matter experts great at developing learning. That is a fascinating, like, kind of a different way of looking at it. 
I think that um, there's a lot of science about how adults learn that's out there that I'm hoping makes its way into the AI and hopefully it's, you know, the, the good stuff. And I think that's, that's the big, the interesting part, right? There's the internal where you point things to, and then there's the external and the companies, at least that we're working with are treading very, very, very slowly because they don't want to infiltrate their internal systems with things that are not what they would want, you know, to have within their company. Yeah. So we're seeing that, I mean, not even started, but they're just trying to figure out how to build the internal capability to then go and put the information or the content they want within the, the technology. So I think that from my perspective, the who knows the content best is always the SME. And typically you have the learning person who knows learning really well and they pull content from the SME and then create the learning. Um, if they have either access to the SME content through AI, uh, they could do that still. And I definitely think the reverse is possible with if the SME has access and the right ways in which to talk to the AI to build it, it can help from that perspective, because they're going to know the content and what they want somebody to know and be able to do out of it versus yeah. the learning person to your point. So that's interesting because part of those SMEs, especially in the enablement space when it's customer facing roles, are people actually doing the job. And for a few years now, there's been this drumbeat around peer to peer learning. You learn from the people who are doing it really well, but the people that are doing it really well can most times not do much more than a video from a learning yeah. perspective. So that opens up a lot of possibilities of making it really super simple for high performers to, you know, be able to kind of do a brain dump and have that become something that's meaningful learning. Yeah. I think as long as they can do the the brain dump, I think sometimes that's the hardest part for the SME, right? And yeah. that's where we ask a lot of the questions. It's like, how do you do this? How do you do that? And, and when you start asking those questions, they're able to explain it to you. Um, I think there are a lot of content SMEs in other areas though, that mm -hmm. are, have a lot documented about what they do and how they do it or how it, how they foresee it happening right within the company. And that's where it's going to be the easiest to pull. But uh, I think in a lot of the customer facing roles, it can be, there's a lot of unconscious competence and people that are, have a harder time explaining to you what it is that they do because they just do it very naturally. And yeah. so having somebody that can interview and tease out what that is, that can be put into the learning uh, or put into the AI is going to be really important. And I think that's the interesting thing with AI and learning as well is that it creates new roles that we haven't necessarily had before um, or talk about, which is, you know, somebody that can understand the business enough to be able to have that conversation to pull out what it is that's needed for the company so that it can then be um, programmed into whatever the internal AI tool is that the company is using. Yeah. How effective, uh, where are we at in this evolution? <laughs> I'm thinking about that unconscious competence, as you said. So let's say I've got a salesperson who's exceptional, top mm -hmm. performer all the way. Can I take 20 of their call recordings and a hundred of the emails that they've sent to customers? And can the AI make sense of, and, and maybe a, a comparison set of a bunch of call recordings and emails from some low performing salespeople. And it, will the AI be able to suss out w what those, what the real differences are between what this individual is doing versus the, their lower performing peers, or are we not quite there yet? I think, I don't think that we are there yet because I don't think we know the, so you have to be very, very specific in your commands and your prompts for AI to be able to do the thing that you want it to actually do. Uh, I've had team members and myself, we've used it multiple times and it's like, okay, that's not quite what I was, you know, what I mean? we've probably all done this. It's like, how do I be more specific about it? And so I think that is part of it, right? Do you know exactly what it is that you're looking for? And can you give all the prompts to be able to suss out? Like you're looking through data, essentially, right? Data mining, um, in order to find the nuggets that you're looking for of what's helping this person be successful versus what's. Uh, making this person less successful. 
And so I think as long as we can be very clear and figure out what those prompts are for the, I mean, the AI is only as good as what it knows and what we put in it, right? And that's kind of the tricky part, I think, that we're in right now. So it's still got to be very much within the realm of conscious differences. I know what I'm looking for as opposed yes. to here, here's a, here's a bunch of stuff. Yeah. I don't know what I'm looking for, but I just know this person is massively outperforming that person. We're not there yet. No. And I think that that's where it's kind of funny. Cause I think people jumped off from there <laughs> in the beginning. And then I think a lot of, a lot of us realized that it was not there yet and that there's still so much more work to be done. Um, we spoke to somebody, a, a guy named Travis on our own podcast. He was actually behind the invention of the online fantasy football. So he's been in the technical space for a long time. And uh, he's been doing a lot of AI research over the last, well, through COVID. He basically was like, well, I don't have anything else to do. I'm going to do a deep dive in, in AI. And it's so conceptual still, right, with where we're at versus user-friendly from a um, – perspective of, yes, we can go out and kind of create some marketing content and we can ask for better titles. And, you know, it, it does a decent job at kind of the basics, but as soon as you get into more complexity, there's a lot more work to be done. Yeah. So it's interesting because the two things you were talking there, we were talking a little bit about like, can it, can it do these pieces and how is a, how is somebody who is an enabler or a learning professional going to actually work in the future to be able to leverage AI for that. I think part of this is thinking about the concept and it's out there a lot for a lot of professions, knowledge professions, which is you, the person that are going to be most successful in the future are the ones that know how to talk to the AI and get it to do what you want it to do. Mm -hmm. um, and the second piece of this is there's a lot of kind of low hanging fruit with learning where it can auto summarize that lesson. It can write your learning objectives. It can um, pull out the key points. It can do a lot of that sort of, I wouldn't call it administrative, but the stuff that is like, it enhances the productivity. So it begs the question, if it's going to enhance the productivity of the learning and development professionals, what are they going to do with the rest of their time? What does the profession of the future look like? And do you have kind of a view into that or, or, or an opinion on it? I think it definitely changes. There are going to be people that are at the higher end of the, like the learning consultant that are going to be extremely important because they're going to be able to understand the holistic view of what you're wanting to do and to organize the material and to be able to also review and say if it's good or not. And then you're going to get um, a whole new role, as you said, of people that can prompt the AI, can you know get the information that's needed, can call it and organize it. But there's going to be less, uh, and I would say as well, having creativity in your mindset when you're going through it. Because that's that's what I'm curious about is like the spontaneousness of AI is not there, right? And yeah. so that is going to be a, a huge asset, I think, from a learning uh, content person is how do you take what you're given and bring it to life for your audience? And I think that's something that is a conundrum also today. And I'm hopeful that that's something we can lean in more as learning professionals. I think I think one of the things that I always find fascinating about your work specifically is that you work with some really monster clients on very specific initiatives that they're trying to do to, to transform their organizations. But you're also working with some medium and smaller customers too. So yep. I'm curious about like, how are you, are you specifically using components of AI within your organization? And then what are you seeing being done? What, how are people, you said they're moving slowly. How are they playing with it in the, in the large companies and are the smaller companies more likely to jump in with both feet? Well, there's a huge security aspect, which I'm sure you all are experiencing as well. And we have to be really careful with something that's proprietary, right? So we're, we can't put anything in any open, any sort of open AI. So everything has to be locked down. And then, and companies are navigating this right now and they're trying to figure it out as well. We've used it for small things like, can I get a better sentence? Right. <laughs> like <laughs> some of the writing, uh, it can definitely help with and titles and some of the creative elements that can come back because that's kind of that marketing content that we talked about in the beginning where it's probably been used the most. Um, 
where we're looking at it that I think is really fascinating with one of our larger clients is, um, is actually, so as a company, what is it that we want our people to be, to know about these different soft skills, right? So if you think about leadership, there's over, I mean, last, like when I first looked it up, it was like over 70,000 leadership books. There's probably over 700 now that we can all self-publish on Amazon or whatever. Exactly. But, you know, which one do you pick as a company that you want to d- double down on and say, this is our leadership philosophy here, you know, in this moment. And so this is what we want to feed into um, our AI tool so that if anybody in the company is going to look for this content, we're getting consistent content across the organization. That's a huge undertaking for a large company. Whereas you can imagine there's content, just so much content available and out there. And so that's what, you know, some of these engineers are thinking about is like, okay, as we are going and developing it, you know, who gets to decide for the company, what goes in and what doesn't, how do we put it in? You know, what is it, you know, who does this address? Do we, parse it into different audiences, whether what your role is in the company and what you're doing specifically, because there's a lot of role-based learning that's out there as well. So there are so many questions right now. And what we're trying to wade through are just some of the, like, how do we start sussing out some of the answers and helping them with that? Yeah. They're very excited about it because they collect all the data around these soft skills. And now they have this being implemented and created for the company, but they're, they're trying to figure out how to bring it in and when. And it definitely sounds like that can be the evolution of an enabler, especially with customer facing roles where you know what your methodology is for certain sales plays. You know, they may be different in a large yeah. company, but you've got those different methodologies and you can feed it very specific things that you know where the parameters are. Um, to me, it sounds like it's it's to, it's a really exciting time, specifically for enablement in the in the learning professional because of the the high definition that you in mo- many organizations you have around what's your methodology, what's your process, yeah. what's your leadership, you know, all of those things. So it sounds like it's going to be a great, a very interesting time for sure. Absolutely. And I think it also is interesting because it it will track changes as we make them in our organizations. And I think that's also an interesting concept with this is, you know, we've known a lot of companies, you know, it's the maturity model, right? So as you mature, you have a sales methodology. As you continue to mature, that may mature as well. We've watched that happen across so many spaces. And so how do you continue to feed it and update it. So it's always giving, you know, people the, the most recent, this is how we work. This is what we do because almost every year a company's strategy is shifting and changing and it kind of just trickles down, especially within the sales and go to market um, areas of the organization has to be on top of it. And so yeah. keeping it as current as possible is going to be, I mean, just like anything today, but this is going to be huge for AI if you have your people pulling from it in order to get the content that they need to address a customer, especially. And that's that so we're, we're working in a customer facing area as well. And it's the same, right? So AI is both changing how the job that the people that we're helping do is like that's changing the, the role. And on top of it, we're feeding the AI content that's going to be able to help them going forward. So yeah, it's a it really can... <laughs> layered, it's a layered thing happening out there. Yeah. And that can lead to a lot of scary things happening. I think everybody's heard the story where, you know, chat GPT made up a story that made up litigation, you know, components that never happened, you know, you cases know, that never happened. And, and, yeah, yeah. The sources, like they want it, they're there. It wants to please, <laughs> I guess it's meant to please. It wants to give and you they, an answer. Yeah, it's like I can give you an answer, and, and then I'll make it better. Sound authoritative, even if it has to make it up. To <laughs> exactly. So I had I heard a story the other day on a call where um, the, our customer said that they had a, a rep um, feeding things into to Chat GPT to even source their own website. So they were like, "Give me, a, you know, a case study on their company." Da 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 da. And this thing, and they were doing it externally because they didn't have the resources internally. And it sourced a case study, took it from a competitor, and replaced their yeah. name in it. 
that's the kind of scary yeah. stuff. And, that, that, you know. and yeah. I think, you know, the larger companies are just like, okay, hang on. Yeah, wait, <laughs> like we just stop. created, especially the tech companies, we just created this thing, but we all need to be, to tread very carefully because you can see the lawsuits flying, yeah, exactly. flying in those moments. And also, so that's the other thing that we have discussed a lot with our clients is the use for your sales roles, right? Or your customer facing roles, whatever they are. How do you ensure that they are getting the right information when they're going to look for it? That's a huge component of what we're talking to them right now, because exactly of what you just said, like they go out there, they get, you know, not great information and then what? And so you still need to have the maturity layers in your organization so that uh, people can help or, you know, things can be run by somebody as we all learn how to figure this out so that you don't, you know, put yourself in a situation of ripping off somebody else's thing or just telling the customer totally the wrong thing. That's completely the wrong thing. Yeah. It's uh, having managed RFP databases in the past and the way that those things can balloon into like a custom answer for a customer. And now it's being used for everybody. Mm -hmm. And I kind of see that happening here on, on such a, a large scale. So I guess this kind of gets us to the question of when you think about AI, what scares you the most, either within learning enablement or just in general? What what scares you the most about it? I think as we think about it for what we do, it, it's almost exactly what you said, where people go too fast, um, too soon. And, uh, you know, we're ruining our data source, right? When that happens, it, because we're inputting information that's not good. And so I, that's probably my biggest anxiety right now is like everybody that's inputting information into it, you know, we have no idea where that's coming from necessarily and how good it is. And I think I would say that was the same issue with the internet. Like when Google first launched, right? It's search engine. It was, it was a lot of the questions about where did this information come from? And we've gotten a lot better and way more mature about our sources and verifying them than, you know, a lot more savvy. And I think AI is in a similar spot, right? So where's it coming from? How do we know it's it's good information. And I think that's going to be a huge crux for yeah. companies as we move forward, especially for the sales organizations. It's ironic that it's really good at taking a ton of information and boiling it down to what's you know kind of meaningful to people. But then if you want it to be accurate, you have to limit <laughs> its capabilities of tapping information and auditing what's going in. And so you're actually, you're, putting the reins around the power, but it's the only way to maintain control. Yeah. How far have we come in using these technologies to understand the impact of what we're doing? I think we've been talking a lot about the creation of learning content, perhaps the delivery of it, but to shift more to the impact of it. For instance, you know, let's say we've been putting a real effort on training our people with uh, better uh, uh, discovery skills and better skills around asking great questions. Are we then able to crunch through large numbers of, of call recordings and other things and actually demonstrate that those who ask more questions and better questions are getting follow-up meetings, they're advancing opportunities, they're getting to revenue, you know, bigger revenue more quickly. Are we at that point where we can at least, you know, I I know when I asked you before, can we just Mm -hmm. go like very open? Like, I don't know what I'm looking for. Just tell me what good is. The answer was no. But if we narrow it in and say, I do know what good, really good discovery, really good question asking is, we believe it's critical. Can we now use these tools to demonstrate that that is correct? I think that you're going to have to further define what that means for the tool because immediately I go, yeah, you can ask good questions, but if your timing's off or you have the wrong person, it doesn't matter how good your questions are, you know, it's going to, it's not going to have the effect that you're looking for. And I, I think we've all watched that happen with somebody that's just like, drilling questions. What about this? Tell me about this. You know, and you're like, oh gosh, your timing is like, you're not reading the other person. Right. So no matter, uh, there is the art of questioning and helping somebody learn how to ask good questions, but there's also the art of the timing of the question. And so, you know, until we can 
get through and learn both of those aspects so that we're not um, doing one thing without the other, it's, you know, it's still going to be difficult. We're human at the end of the day, unless you're going to put, wrote, you know, the two machines to talk to one another, which they might really love each other. <laughs> like, yeah, definitely know, not. Have a, a great not, conversation. Not a, but... more, more questions is good. Uh, full stop. I, I've, I've been on some discovery calls where it was like an interrogation. <laughs> it was not good at all. It was an interrogation. It was, it was 18 questions that the seller needed to fill out an answer for to establish BANT or to fill their Salesforce instance or whatever it was. And it was terrible for me as a buyer. So yeah, no, I'm with you all the way there, but. So it's I like, how do, how do we like clue in the AI to be able to pull that through? Right. So how do you explain um, somebody asking questions at the right cadence, you know, and the AI can't see the other person, you know, so it's, it, that's hard, right. When you can't hear the tone, can't see facial um, features or whatever, if we're on Zoom calls, et cetera, um, whether we're in person, those you are the You ought to be able to know though, are... whether I'm just going through a list of 18 questions and not even honestly listening to what you're saying because I'm just on to the next question or whether it's a dialogue and whether my next question builds on your response. That's right. So it's how good are the parameters that we give it? to be able to figure that out so that it can give us in return good content. And I think that's the hard part, right? So somebody that doesn't have a lot of experience wouldn't be able to do that right. because they're, they're not going to have been in all the calls you've been in Steve and like witnessed and seen this happen and, you know, all of that. And so I do think that that's going to be a really critical part that a lot of us play that have a lot of experience is making sure that we're giving the right parameters for the AI so that it's pulling content that we believe is, is decent. Right. And it does seem like a really powerful place mm -hmm. to be focused that, cause I, I do worry. And I, I know Heather and I talk about this a lot that AI is, is, is just largely being used as, as a quantity play. I can create more content, more emails, more training, more of this, more, more, more. Um, we, <laughs> we need to focus on better. And, and that's agree. harder, right? More, more is easy. Better is hard. More is definitely easy. And I would say there's plenty out there that we don't need more, <laughs> <laughs> you know, hence the like leadership book examples, or you could go into sales books, et cetera. You know, it's, there's so much out there. And uh, typically when there's, you know, and I don't know about you all, but what we see is when people aren't doing the things right, it's the human skills that are lacking. It's not necessarily the, skills that are easier to teach. Yeah, that's so true. And, you know, the, when, you, when we think about, we used to talk a lot about this back at Serious Decisions and Foresters, the, the, if that productivity is really the combination of effectiveness and efficiency, how much mm -hmm. you can do and how well you can do it. And if you over pivot on either one of those, you start to go awry. For yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And part of it, like, like you mentioned is the ability for the machine to have all of the context of what's yeah. going on. And even with conversation intelligence and the biometrics that are being embedded in that, there are all these studies that are coming out on top of those saying that um, there's racial um, inequities where they're saying, you know, they're reading the faces wrong, ageism. Mm -hmm. you know, they mm -hmm. think my wrinkles mean I'm, you know, mad. <laughs> so <laughs> all of that fun stuff that it's not, it's never going to be perfect. You know, it's just never, it's, they're never going to be able to. Well, and then you, you take that just like you said, and you go via different cultures and I can like bring this full circle for you. We, you know, I would think that most French people are mad most of the time, but apparently it's just passion. Uh, there you go. <laughs> right. But like from my American view, it's like, wow, they're really aggressive. My husband's like, no, no, no super fine. <laughs> and so, you know, not knowing that, across different cultures, again, you're pulling in data and it's not accurate. It's not, you know, I'm not reading them right. So I, I'm having to adjust how I read yeah. somebody to be able to get the right temperament. It's yeah, hard. that's hard. It's hard. And I think I'm sure there are computer, computer scientists and AI experts who would argue that you show the machine enough and eventually it'll get it. You give it enough input yeah. and it'll figure it out. And the question is, to what end? You know, yeah. to what end? Is what that are we what trying we really to need? get yeah. Yeah. from it? 
Exactly. So finally, I have one last question for you. You know, if you had one piece of advice for learning leaders who are looking at leveraging AI in their processes right now, and what would you what would you say to either do or not do, or maybe there's one of both? Yeah, it's interesting because I want to say like, you know, go slow to go fast, which is an oldie, but I, you know, I feel like we have to remind ourselves of that constantly because it's so easy as Steve, as you were saying, like to just jump in and be like, oh, we can get all this stuff. Right. Um, and instead create a strategy around it. I would love for the learning leaders to come up with their AI strategy that they can present to their executives and get buy-in on it so that everybody's on the same page of what we're trying to do instead of a lot. I think there's a lot of assumptions out there right now about where AI is at and what's possible and doing more research and understanding it and putting that together, I think would be helpful for any business, especially in the learning space. And I also think embracing it as well, which is kind of the opposite of what I'm saying in some ways, but it's here. It's going to be something that we use. So um, have people play with it, set up, you know, just let's play with it for a while. Let's not try to use it to meet some end that, you know, is in our goals this year. <laughs> That's going to be really difficult and you're probably not going to be very successful, but let's start uh, playing with it and making some safe spaces so that your people can get used to it so that it doesn't feel as scary for them. That's what we're, you know, very much trying to do. It's like, well, let's put this in and let's see what we get. And I have people on my team doing that as well. And being critical, right? So how do you think critically then about what the AI gives you and whether it's good or not and, and the usage of it? So I think there's a lot in there that we can do, but I would say embracing it and also having a really strategic plan around how we want to approach it. Probably the two things that I, the customers I see doing that, I think it's very smart. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, it's. I think there is some fear out there that, it totally. will replace jobs and that it will do, it will cause harm. Um, one of the greatest comments I saw on it was CNN was interviewing um, one of the top specialists in this area from Stanford. And they said, <laughs> he said, the guy from Stanford said, are you, you know, the question was, are you, do you think this is going to replace a lot of jobs? And he said, well, if you employ uh, psychotic six-year-olds in your organization, <laughs> then yes, go out and have large language models go replace those psychotic six-year-olds. And I think that's kind of indicative of, of a little bit where that is right now, but six-year-olds grow up. So, it, you know, playing with it and understanding it is great advice. Yeah. I think making it light, if you're a leader, like making it really light right now for your teams and letting them have the opportunity to play with it and tell you what they think and do some fun things makes it less scary. And I think, you know, to your point, Heather, I do, I think there's a lot of fear out there. Is this going to replace my job, et cetera. In fact, when it first, like when chat GPT first came out, I had somebody on my team go in and ask for it to write something up about oxygen and came back with, he was like, it was really good. And I was like, yeah, because that's basically what we wrote. Yes. <laughs> it's just giving you your, your <laughs> own work back. <laughs> so good job. Good job, you. <laughs> but wait, wait a minute. Isn't that what consultants do, Juliana? <laughs> <laughs> they, they make it all, all the time. Deck, though, you know, so. <laughs> yeah, it looks prettier. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Juliana, today. It's been, it's been great. And I know it's late in France, so we're going to let you oh, go, good. but we really appreciate the conversation. Thank you for having me. It's been fun. Thanks, Juliana. That was great catching up with Juliana. Heather, what were some of your largest takeaways from that conversation? I think, you know, the, the, conf the everybody is talking about AI and it is a very popular topic right now. And I found that it was quite interesting that she diverted a little bit from what we're hearing the popular topics being, first of all, not content marketing, um, and also thinking about it very specifically in the learning space, but not necessarily about making the rep more effective and efficient, which clearly we want to do as an outcome, um, 
or the enabler more effective and efficient, which is clearly another outcome, which we touch on later. But also first, she went to the ability to make folks who have a lot of stuff in their brains, those SMEs, and how do we take what they know and maybe even skip the intermediary so they can do a brain dump and be able to make good learning um, from what they know instead of them having to interpret that to somebody who interprets it to somebody who creates the learning, which obviously will make the entire process much more effective and efficient. And that I think is a something that hasn't been talked a lot about. Yeah, I think that's really exciting. You, you think about the amount of institutional knowledge that resides in every firm and, and it's in the brains of some of your leaders, some of your experts in various space. And so it's hard to get it out in manageable ways. It's hard for that subject matter expert to, to find the time to really structure it and work it through with, with learning and enablement people. And it's also hard for others to fully understand their own subject matter experts and, and, and the nuances of, of what they're saying and, and the idea of being able to brain dump, as you said. And also I'm thinking, you know, we ought to be able to feed in recordings of conference speaking, recordings of podcasts, recordings of, of calls that these people have done and, and then have the AI make sense of that in a way that an enablement professional or a learning professional can have a real assist in turning that tremendous amount of, of knowledge into some structured, consumable delivery. I, I, th I think that's going to be incredibly impactful. It is. And as Juliana said, we're not there yet. But part of that is, is feeding the beast because you have to have a tremendous amount of examples of what good looks like for it to learn appropriately and to make correlations. And most companies do not, at least not down to the level of specificity within a role or within, you know, this is what good looks like talking to a financial services person, but not necessarily what good looks like when you're talking to somebody in the transportation industry. So those nuances need a lot of examples for it to be able to learn appropriately. So yeah, we're not there yet, but the possibilities are just amazing. And I just can't wait to see what happens in the coming years. Yeah. And that, that takes you to the balance that she spoke of uh, a couple of times in a couple different ways. On one hand, you need to be grounded in strategy. You need to know what you're doing and why you're doing it. But on the other hand, you got to get on with it. You've got to just do it. And I, I see it almost like a, a road with, with a ditch on either side. And some companies are going to drive into the, into the ditch of inaction, the, the ditch that says this isn't important or it isn't now or, or we're not ready. Uh, but I think others are going to drive into the opposite ditch of, of going too fast, too far without the strategic guidance and, and just, a. Uh, insatiable appetite for, for delivery of more and more content, more and more training. And, and I think the key, at least what I was hearing from Juliana is that we need to avoid both of those ditches and we need to stay on the road rooted in strategy, but also getting on with it and, and enabling and empowering our people to get in there and, and learn and explore. And, and if we can avoid both of those ditches, we're going to go a long way on that road. Yeah. And I think setting that strategy, as you said, making sure there's guardrails around how it can and can't be used. And then thinking about it, about those low hanging fruit things that can be done really easily. Like how do you write a summary? How do you write a quiz? All of those things are really, those are things that, you know, generative AI can do really well. But then there's the stuff that you were saying is the art of the possible that we need to experiment with and play with. And we all need to understand what is going to work, what is working now, and what you know can we do with it in the future, and what makes sense. Exciting times. Indeed. If you enjoyed this episode, follow the show on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. And check out gotomarket-magic.com for show notes and resources. Want more conversations like these, but live and in person? 
join us at Shift. Shift is the annual conference for go-to-market leaders in San Diego. This year, it's October 23rd to the 26th, and it's going to be fantastic. Go to seismic.com slash shift for registration and more information.